Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Diana White, the Director of Programs and Events, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to this PGA conversation with the creators and executive producers behind Evil, which is streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Please join me in welcoming the co-creators, executive producers, and showrunners, Michelle and Robert King. Before we begin, also a quick thank you to CBS Studios for making this panel possible for the Producers Guild. And it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator, Jen Cheney. Jen is a TV critic for Vulture and New York Magazine. She previously worked at the Washington Post and has contributed over the years to the New York Times, Vanity Fair, and numerous other publications. She is also the author of the book, As If, The Oral History of Clueless. Thank you all so much for being here. And Jen, I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you, Robert and Michelle. Thank you, Jen. Uh, um, you know, as, as TV critics, as you know, we get a lot of episodes thrown at us more than ever now. And there's certain shows that when you get the episodes, you're like, oh, I can't wait to watch this. And that's what Evil has been like for me. Every time there's a new episode, I'm like, oh, good. I can't wait to watch this. Um, thank you. I want to... Oh, you're welcome. I want to start with uh, a general question for you, which is obviously season two, you moved from CBS to Paramount Plus. And as I understand it, that change happened after you were already basically done shooting the whole season. So I'm just wondering what kind of impact, if any, it had creatively on the decision making process and, you know, post production or just how you were thinking about things. Well, you're exactly right. It, it recalibrated the thinking in post and because that was the only place frankly we could make any adjustments and it did it on three levels probably the most important we moved from a 42 minutes and change length to 48 minutes we still had to stay within 48 minutes because it had already been sold to certain places overseas and they couldn't go uh longer uh because on good fight because it always started as streaming we could make that up to anything under 60 minutes second thing is we went back in and put in swear words which is insane except there were certain places where Katja, it made sense for her to call Leland that fucker instead of that bastard. So luckily it slipped fairly easily into the mouth. And then the third, we did have probably four days of possible shooting where we knew we were streaming and that we put in just a little more sex than we normally would. I mean, in the episode you see, uh, here's Essence for Silence, that subtitled section of what's going on in David's mind was all PG related originally, and we were able to make it much more R rated in a in a good way, not just to do it to show, hey, we're streaming, we can do what we want, we can make people smoke. Mm -hmm. Instead, it was just because that was the best way to show how hard it is to silence the mind. Right. I mean that that you're referring to that moment when he's supposed to be, you know, introspective and praying, and there's just like a a crawl of fuck on the fuck, bottom fuck, of the screen fuck, 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 which fuck, is fuck, yeah. which is how i feel when i watch cable news that's what the crawl looks like to me <laughs> um, uh can you recall what it was originally supposed to be yeah it was um it was actually much more stream of consciousness it was longer which was a mistake it always started with the idea of seeing this stain on the floor and saying oh who did that oh it must be one of the monks who vomited there and then that took us down the route where he started thinking about um, you know, I got to make, how would T.S. Eliot do that when he wrote, you know, Ash Wednesday, I've got to focus on that. Why doesn't anybody quote T.S. Eliot anymore? I guess because of anti-Semitism. So it was much more, you know, when your mind is free floating, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're actually jumping from one lily pad of thought to another. And you almost have to fall back to figure out, okay, how did I get here? What was the original thought? And so there was a lot of that. And obviously it bored us to death in the editing room when we <laughs> you know, just was like, oh, oh my God. So instead we went the, you know, the good old Scorsese route, fuck, fuck, fuckity, fuck, fuck, you know, and that the distraction was purely about sex. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, I, I'm always interested in what showrunners have to say about this because, you know, it, traditionally in network television, as you were talking about in terms of length, you, you have like a very tight amount of time that you can have an episode. You usually would write for like ad breaks and things like that. Um, you would have episodes that roll out every week and in the case of Evil, it still does, but you have people who might watch it in that way. You have people who might watch it in chunks. You have people who might wait till it's all done and binge it all at once. How, how much of all of those different ways of watching it are you thinking about when you're trying to 
write the story? Because I, I just thinking about it now kind of gives me a headache. Uh, I'll speak personally. I guess I always assume people are going to watch it week to week. Maybe just it's from a background in network television. Mm -hmm. And I don't spend a lot of time worrying about how it's going to be consumed. You know, it's just, okay, best episode we can and, and then moving on with it. Mm -hmm. We've always been attracted ever since The Good Wife to this short story, but they're pearls on a necklace route. So there's a serialized story and then these short stories. And we should say, you know, I think it's forgotten that that's what Sopranos did. Sopranos mm -hmm. were short stories that you could watch independently, but there was a serialized story throughout. It's what Crown does. Crown has these amazing episodes that you could watch independently. So I do think we sometimes in this idea that there are eight hour movie series um, that we've lost track of, there's a real difficulty, but a strength in doing this short story version of TV where you could consume one and get a story from beginning to middle to end and yet still be looking at an arc that takes us over the whole season. Right, absolutely, yeah. The, the show is, you're, you're very right, ep episodic and feel, but also there's a larger, broader story. And I think a lot of the principles of, you know, traditional network writing still apply. Like at the end of an episode, you want it to end in a way that makes you want to come back and watch, whether that's in five minutes or a week. So uh, it's not that, that drastically different. Um, I want to ask you about the motif that runs through this season, the pop-up book of terrifying things, which informs the names of all the episodes. It also introduces the episodes and it even weaves its way into, into the actual story. Where did the idea for that come from? I think it was yours. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, uh, sorry, I have it right here. Oh, we wow. <laughs> were we were inspired by these great pop-up books. Um, I don't know, are you backwards when I show it? The pop-up no. of phobias and the pop-up book of nightmares. Wow, those and, are real books? Yeah, and so we got the artist who did that. So we Valvis. reached out to the actual artist. Uh, and it was our idea to do it just as a way to, you know, when you're, we still thought we were a network at that point. When you're doing that and you're creating all this fractured storytelling, you want some linkage. You want something that gives it some, embraces everything. So we thought of a pop-up book that started traditionally with pop-ups like you normally would see, but then mm -hmm. would get a little more CGI as you went through the year that there would be creatures that would pop out at you. It felt like another way to kind of scare. And we're always trying to find titles that sometimes link the whole season, um, mm -hmm. episode titles, whether you know it's making fun of the friends way of the, you know, the one with this or the or or you know, gang who you know, if there was any way to link episodes through titles, it's always helpful. And plus mm -hmm. it played into the thematic idea in the series of childhood can be fraught with scary stuff. Sure. So when you came up with the idea, did you know that it would eventually, that, that book would find its way into the hands of Kristen's daughter? Or was that an uh, like a, a thing that came later? No, once that you, came that later. Came That's what came okay. later. Okay. Well, I love that. I love that motif. Um, and now I'm interested in reading those books you just showed. <laughs> <laughs> They're fun. They're very good. <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you about a couple of episodes specifically, certainly S is for Silence, which we'll get to in a moment. But just real quickly, I also wanted to talk about the, the elevator game episode. Um, because I, one of the things I love about this show is there's a lot of shows that are, you know, in the horror genre, but tend to be a little more like suspenseful and not necessarily super scary. And I find certain episodes of the show to be genuinely scary, that being one. Um, is that elevator game thing based on a real thing? Yeah, Korean game. Uh, you okay. could probably go online and find it. We, we changed some elements of it, but it, it's inspired by a Korean game played by kids. And you know, it's, to, it's, the, it's like telling tales around a campfire. It's just like, isn't it cool if you do this, 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 your head will explode. You know, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what it's based on. And we, you know, uh, I believe it was told to us, wasn't it by Niala? I thought it was Niala LeBeau. One of our writers room who is collector of like folklore and or everything. Or it could was, have been Ion. Could have been Ion. Sorry, um, one of the two. Uh, from our writers room told us this uh, thing and it inspired our imagination anyway, because, you know, we're in New York and 
everything you do is elevator related. And I'm terrified by elevators anyway. Um, you know, at one point, Josh Charles, a friend got caught in an elevator that dropped or something. You know, it was just like, there's so many ways elevators can kill us uh, that I think that's terrifying. So how did you write the episode with that fear in your mind? <laughs> was it therapeutic in some way? No, no it was not. <laughs> <laughs> It was not, it was, and especially where Ben ends up, it was like, this is, this is a version of what COVID was doing to us, was making us, I mean, at the end, he's trapped, and oh, no, it, it was not therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Writing Good Fight is therapeutic about the world and about Trump. The, the terrifying elements of good, of uh, evil are not. Uh, it, it, it heightens evil even more, I think. Did, was it therapeutic to you? No, not in the slightest. <laughs> but are you, do you have the same phobia of elevators? No, I do not. Mercy. Okay. I, so I go in first. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, what was there, or what made that episode for us was trying to include the kids in the investigation itself because they're turning it into a roller coaster ride, which is fun, but also is a little nerve wracking because you know it's a TV show that's going to make things scary. So the very fact they were so blase about it made them us you go oh no what's going to happen what's going to happen sure and it does seem like the kind of thing that would be like a tiktok trend or dare yeah. or something like that um since you said that i wanted to mention i love that christian's daughters they, they felt like they were a little more part of the story a little more integral this season and every time they're all together i just find it so delightful uh when you have those scenes where it's all of the girls and they're all talking over each other how much of that is scripted how much is it just them just improvising a little bit 50 50 50 what yeah. we do is we have a, a heading called daughters and then we usually drop in four partial lines underneath that that are just guides to what these incredibly good actors because we cast them all four at a time coming in to see how they would do overlapping improv mm -hmm. and so they were always ready at the beginning by the way that's the best way to cast kids because to bring them in one at a time and put them in front of, of all these casting people and have them you know be natural or be is just horrifying but to bring them in where they're supported by an army of other kids is a very kind way to cast i know it doesn't work for any other show so that's not great advice but so they've always from the very beginning been encouraged more than anybody else in our show to ad lib based on these four partial lines that we throw in. And I was going to add that they are the only actors on any of our shows ever that have been encouraged to improvise. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That's funny. Well, I mean, in terms of bringing them all in together like that, especially for these roles, it makes sense because you want to see the sisters together and see how they interact with each other. And if they if they don't work together, the whole concept kind of falls, falls through. Um, and then the other thing that's going on in that episode is, uh, you know, David trying to address racism in the church, um, which is another thing that I love about the show, that it it does, as so much of your work does, address social issues and weave them into the into the series. How do you decide, especially since you're doing the good fight, which is so focused on that, what things you're going to talk about in evil and where to kind of weave them in? You know, I think on that one, we were really playing the idea of how Leland and David are in these meetings together, addressing Leland possibly getting exorcism. And it felt like what Leland would lean into. So I think there it was based on character leads us to politics. So often on Good Fight, we start with politics and find the character link. But on Evil more and more, we start with the character and go to Okay, well, what is interesting to us, I'm being Catholic since, you know, baptism as a, a, a two month old is being part of an organization that is flawed in the most major ways to examine that I think is interesting. And Leland would be so much the provoker of that. Sure. Yeah, well, and speaking of, of Leland, um, Michael Emerson is just so amazing um, and it just, it seems like Leland, who was already bonkers to begin with, really got to let his freak flag fly this season. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering again, like how much of that was intentional on your part or how, and how much of it was, let's, let's give Michael some stuff to, that we know he's gonna run with. 
you know, I, I wouldn't say we started out with a mandate, but it's just so much fun to see what he does. And it's so obvious he can go crazy um, <laughs> that, you know, as one is moving through the season, it just organically uh, gets put in. I would also say this is one thing that happened because of COVID. Originally, before COVID, we started with the idea that we were doing a haunted subway station and it had it started in a very grand way. And when we talked to the line producer, uh, Kristen Bernstein, about it, clearly we'd have to do so much with CGI on green screens on our stages, we thought that's insane. So it basically turned everything inside to our main cast, to our top six, seven, you know, people on our call sheet. How can you make, you know, the, the lower the numbers were at the beginning of COVID, the more you could make the day and not be tainted by a lot of other actors coming in. So we decided to turn inside to a story where Leland was the problem. And it was a continuing story about him saying, I'm possessed, now unpossess me, you know, exercise me. But it's really a con on his part. And that kind of made it all about our not first, our six people on our call sheet. Mm -hmm. Well, not that I wasn't interested in the subway idea, but I feel like that turned out to be a blessing in a lot of ways because he is just so much fun and the way he interacts with everybody is so great. Um, so I want to start talking about S's for Silence, which you both wrote and then Robert, you also directed. And as people have probably seen if they watch the, the episode is an episode that takes place almost entirely in silence um, as they're at this monastery where they're not allowed to speak lest they let loose a demon. Um, first of all, tell me about the genesis of the idea for this episode. Was this inspired by a real monastery that has this going on or? Uh, no, it was inspired by Robert wanting to do a silent episode of something for many years and pitching it at the beginning of every season and being swatted down. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like midway, like third season of Good Wife, let's do a silent episode this year. And everybody would go, because we always had this same writers, they'd all grown like, oh, how do we even do it? And we even wrote an outline one year. It might've been our fourth season on Good Wife. It was just a disaster and everybody really didn't love it. And then um, the idea was from Davida, right? Davida Scarlett. On our current staff, she said Who that- Who knew that Robert had been itching to do a silent episode. Her idea was this is perfect now, or she doesn't talk that way. She said, you know what we could do is move it to a silent monastery. And it was like, oh, I was letting go of that. But now <laughs> and Michelle was even rolling her eyes. So, okay, here we go. <laughs> Uh, so uh, it it was a hard thing to build, but it once you got into the spirit of it, I think I think everybody's like, proud of it now. Extreme. They were they were not proud Extreme. of it as it was going on because mm. it's a different way. I mean, community would do this sometimes. The half hour community they'd have episodes that were about folding time in and out, and those are the I think I saw a board of theirs, and it was the hardest thing to build. It's very exciting when it's done, but only in the rear view mirror as you're doing it, it's not fun. Although that said, the actors were thrilled oh, yeah. from the moment they got the script. What, it, it was, I would say, very difficult until there was a script and then everyone was thrilled. Yeah, the writer's room was hard. It was a hard build because you had to think how you could explain plot with the, most, with the fewest words possible. Right. And you don't get to write very much dialogue, which is the fun part, or at least some of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm curious. Right? Yeah, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No. I'm curious why you always wanted to do a silent episode so much. Is it just because of the challenge? Are you a, a silent film fan? Where did that come I from? I am a silent film fan, but more not for drama, for Buster Keaton. Um, I'm not even a big fan of Harold Lloyd or Charlie Chaplin, but Buster Keaton, I was always uh, felt like the, it was a good way of looking at the world the world almost as mechanism and how do people uh, interact with mechanisms. That's why I think some of the best parts are with things in mm -hmm. both evil, but also in that episode. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's just a challenge to a director. Um, how do you on a TV schedule, how do you get all your shots that you need to create uh, not only continuity, but explain scenes without people talking? I mean, that is a, a fun challenge. I mean, um, you know, I think that was it. It's, um, it also, oh, I would say in a scary show, I think our show likes silence a lot. 
we like, uh, we don't use as much music as often a lot of horror movies or TV shows do because the, the scares are really is when everybody shuts up and then your ears are very attuned to what's coming and what is going to scare you next. And that just seemed to be a, to have a silence where you couldn't scream, you know, in, in space, they can't hear you scream, but in a silent monastery, they can't hear you scream either, which just seemed like interesting. By the way, I should add, the only reason we had the audacity to try this is because we have such good actors. Because, I mean, for an actor not to have lines to fall back on uh, is asking a lot of them. And so the fact that we knew the, the caliber of actors we have is the only reason we thought we could even attempt it. Mm -hmm. So as the director, Robert, what was it like trying to direct people in these scenes where, as, as Michelle just said, you, they don't have the dialogue to work with and it is uh, a lot more subtle. I, it was scary. I, I would say what was good is I hate headphones. So director wise, not having to wear them is a dream. <laughs> and then, especially because of COVID, because you have glasses, you have a mask, you have, it's kind of like your Tommy from the opera Tommy, you know, it's just awful. So to get rid of those, to sh continue shooting when the airplane's going over, because usually you're saying cut because you got all this other noise. And then the other thing was being, you know, you watch the dailies and all you hear is me yelling, you know, okay, now do this, do that, you know, which has got to be a real boon to silent directors back in the 20s. But now your punishment directing that way is to listen to yourself in the editing room and hate your own voice. So all that was good. The, the difficulty is, you know, there are some scenes, especially when our actors come into the silent monastery at first, where there's five characters in close proximity, where you need it, the coverage, and you need it, the coverage to explain itself because you didn't have dialogue. And so, that was poorly covered. I mean, I hated what I did that day because you thought you got it when you really didn't because you needed to get twice as many versions of it or three times as many versions of it because of the needs of the subtlety of looks instead mm -hmm. of dialogue. Dialogue covers a ton of sins. And without dialogue, you really got to be pretty good at shooting to get everything you need. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that would also have been a tough episode to edit for that reason, right? Yes, <laughs> Matt Krieger, who's one of our better editors. We, uh, first of all, I did a very for good first cut, but it was also 20 minutes long, um, which was which crazy. Which is shocking for TV. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we had to cut it down. And when we cut it down, we cut out a lot of subplots. And the difficulty is ADR gets you over the problem of a lot of dropping a lot of subplots. You could still keep the thread of the stories going by having some characters and not on screen saying, wow, I'm glad we picked that up. Because now that we picked that up, we can solve the case. But without that dialogue, you're just, you have nothing. So those magic slates that everybody had as a kid or mm -hmm. my age, uh, we were able to visually put other writing on them than what was written on the day, which was a lifesaver because it got you over a lot of humps. Oh, okay, that's funny. I love the magic slates. I thought it was great that, it, that that's what they were using to talk to each other. Um, can you talk a little bit about the scene that you shot with um, Kristen and Fenna and the, the barrels and the whiskey? Because that was very like, I don't know, Buster Keaton or Chaplin or who's the right analogy, but it, it, but it, it reminded me of that kind of a movie. It started with the inclination to have a nun there, but to not play nuns the way you usually think of them as all religious all the time. And to have someone who's young, who there's some poignancy because she's gonna be there her whole life and never saying a word, which is, if you think about it, is a gut punch of the most, uh, the hardest time you can imagine. But like a lot of monasteries, they make their money from alcohol, whether wine, here with whiskey. And it felt like that it would be funny if Kristen was connecting with someone who was as different of a life as you can imagine through alcohol, but also this activity of soaking these barrels with whiskey. And that took us to the comedy. We, at first we were thinking the barrels were gonna be on their butts. So they would be down in it and be a little like Lucille Ball squishing grapes. But mm -hmm. that wasn't as funny and as visually arresting as turning them on their side and having this kind of, what Buster Keaton does so well is you're flat looking, you, 
you almost make it a cartoon panel, which allowed us to have Katja be for part of it, a stunt woman be for part of it, and be able to cut between them. And again, as Michelle says, the best thing in the world, Katja Herbers is one of the funniest uh, visual performers you can imagine. Um, and because when we cast her, we saw some of her Dutch work and she had a lot of fun comedic, she was really a full body performer comically. And so that, and the one we lucked into is the actress who played Fena. And I think what we did is we shot it in a Brooklyn distillery <laughs> and oh, wow. we brought in, those are our barrels we brought in, the wine barrels and everything and the ones that cut off the side. So it was very odd to be shooting out at a monastery out in Long Island and then be doing this scene uh, completely differently in Brooklyn and to kind of make it all seem like one. And the actress has had a lot of fun, but it was also, you had to lube up these barrels so they'd slide around. So everybody came out of it a mess because it wasn't whiskey in then, it was lube. And they had to <laughs> like squirt on tons of lube to make the barrel slippery. So think of that every time you watch it now, that's basically what lube does. And of course the, uh, the inside joke for ourselves was that uh, when Kristen is um, becoming friendly with Fena, she has no idea that Fena isn't an American and doesn't speak English and discovers in fact, Fena is Dutch, which we did because Katja is Dutch. Just mm. as, you know. But that's nice. A little joke for ourselves. Yeah, I, I liked I liked that scene for the comedy of it. I also like how it sort of ties in later with sort of the feminist undertones and the and the idea of the women being separate and sort of finding some some liberation in a way um, in that context. Um, so I have to ask you about season three. Where are you with that? Is that in the process of being written? That's exactly right. We're written up through episode five. Uh, and we've shot up through, we just started episode three. Okay. Shooting, I'm sorry. We just started shooting okay. episode three. We oh, okay. uh, almost finished editing episode one. That'll be finished by Monday. Okay. And will that be 13 episodes or how many? 10. 10. 10. Uh, okay. Paramount Plus, it was 13 yes year, last year because it was still supposed to be network. This year, uh, I think all the Paramount Plus stuff is trying to be 10 episodes. Okay. And so I, I wanna return to the, the question that I started with in the beginning, now that you're working on season three, in season three, knowing now that you're on Paramount Plus, how has that affected your writing process, if at all? Not as much as you would think. Uh, you can contradict me, but it feels as though the show, we're happy where the show lives. So there, the only change is not feeling constrained by the time the episode length, which is which is a tremendous benefit. But in terms of tone, in terms of language, nudity, you know, maybe it'll change five, ten percent. But I didn't think there was anything we really felt we needed to break through. I mean, we're doing more adult themes this year, but I think that's just because that's what interests us in the moment. I think that could have got by with network. We would have, we've never been told on network we can't do an adult theme. You, right. you have to you have to photograph it. I mean, the, the Good Wife, the second season, it was kind of lingus of 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 the husband going down on uh, Juliana Margulies' character. So, and I think you're allowed. You just have to be more delicate on network. Here, we're not as delicate. I would say. Right. Right. You can put a lot of fucks on the screen. Yes. In, in many ways. A lot of <laughs> You have no fucks uh, left in your life, but you put them on the screen. Right. <laughs> um, and then I'm just curious, and I, I'm sure you can't directly answer this, but are we going to learn more about Lexi's tale? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Because I want to know more all about that. I love that as sort of a metaphor for just- you know what we I'm liked about it liked. is that, you know, with adolescent girls, with TikTok and everything, there's this tendency to have body image issues. And what we thought it would seem like an after school special uh, are addressing after of body image issues. And then the comedy would be that her problem is that she looks like a lizard in her <laughs> mind because she's the de she's the devil spawn, which I think was a funny to us. Uh, but I we do continue with it because we find it um, 
you know, obviously that doesn't go away for Lexus. She is the same right. character from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's a way to have fun with that and also take it seriously, which is what you guys have been doing so far. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. It was so great to have this conversation and I can't wait to see what you all do with season three. Good to see thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.